Hey Cheshire, do you like philosophy? You mean when you use all those big words in big books that nobody wants to read that bore me and put me to sleep? Oh, come on Cheshire, that's not fair. But it's true, isn't it? Half the time philosophers seem like they're preaching at us when they are barely able to bumble through their lives. However, the important thing is, is that philosophy is not owned by philosophers. And as I think you'll understand very soon, everybody's doing philosophy all the time. It's just a matter of how well you're doing it. So what is the purpose of philosophy and what am I doing? What am I up to talking about it on this channel? I love philosophy very, very much. And I'm on a little bit of a weird mission that you might want to follow along with, which is that I'm trying as much as I can to reread everything that I read in my BA, my two MAs and my PhD. Now, it's a monumental task and it's going to involve reading a lot of philosophy. And then of course, we have the great memory masters, many of whom were philosophers. As part of this project, I also want to get certain books up on the screen. Think of them like video audiobooks, such as On the Composition of Images by Giordano Bruno. And we have Scott Gosnell's permission to use this, to literally get it up on the screen, to dig deep into the granular details, both of the techniques, but also the philosophy that can help you not only remember things better, but craft a better life. So if that sounds good to you, hit that thumbs up, get subscribed if you're new here, and hit me up in the comments. Let me know who your philosopher is or what your personal philosophy is, and I would love to hear from you and start the conversation going as we dive deeper into the philosophy of memory. Now, one of the greatest things about philosophy is it helps us think. Not only that, but it helps us sharpen how we think, and so we get a bit of progress over time. And even if we don't ultimately progress eternally, getting better and better and better and better still, which I do believe is possible, we can at least maintain our thinking skills so they don't decline. And if they decline, the purpose of philosophy is to help us notice that they've declined and correct course as soon as possible. Another point here is that thinking philosophically can help you in whatever career you feel called to. Lawyers, doctors, bakers even can benefit from philosophy, business people, artists, musicians. Philosophy helps guide us in each and every area, not only because when we think philosophically, we have more insight into what we're doing and how we're doing it, but also because we can look at the history uh, and the ideas that other people have brought to those fields and start to pick into them, start to find different angles and use those angles to then shape and reshape what we're doing in each and every field. So whether you're a computer programmer or a dentist, philosophy can be a great way of improving your position in those fields. Now you might be saying, hang on, hang on, I'm just a janitor or a street sweeper, or I'm just a young student and I can't see how philosophical thinking is gonna help me at all. Well, I disagree. You know, I was a janitor in a movie theater back when I was in university and I was reading Plato's Republic in the afternoon and wiping up spilled pop and popcorn from midnight until four in the morning. So philosophy was definitely something that helped me survive that terrible situation that went on for months and months and months while I worked there. And it was truly painful. But because philosophy is a form of active thinking, I was able to keep my mind engaged, keep my mind focused on the goal, on the other side of what was coming so that I could get, you know, my little coins together to pay the tuition so that I could finally, you know, escape that miserable condition. Because if I didn't get properly educated, I was going to wind up being a janitor for the rest of my life. But thinking actively not only allowed me to, you know, get through those boring times, but also think about how to get out of that boring situation and never go back. And part of the way it works is that you're able to analyze thought, your own thoughts, the thoughts of others, and then change your world so that you can produce alternative outcomes. And you can also persuade others in ways that helps them change their world. Now, this is where ethics comes in and you always wanna be positive and forward thinking in terms of their best possible outcomes and go through the different angles and just be transparent that you're even trying to influence people, which is a very philosophical thing to do, to expose your biases, to expose your intent and enable them to participate in the dialogue with you, which is what philosophy is all about. It's about active, transparent interaction 
at the level of conversation. And as we engage in this thing called active thinking, we might also engage in something that is creating new concepts, which is what Deleuze and Guattari talk about in What is Philosophy, a book I highly recommend that you read so that you can think about how could I create new concepts, new ideas that are part of active thinking. Although it's pretty rare, we can also potentially create entirely new kinds of conversation. So Michel Foucault in What is an Author points out that people like Freud and Marx created new discourses. They made it possible to have conversations that people weren't really having before. And that might sound crazy, but you know, if you do your history, they really weren't thinking about things like the unconscious or economics in quite that way before. They opened a new way of thinking and then new concepts came in. Now, that can have some negatives to be sure. But we always want to be able to balance the positives and the negatives and then use our active thinking to find those positives and then change them in a way that helps reduce the negatives, if not remove the negatives completely. And we can't do that if we're not having conversations. So there's always a risk in philosophy. And Nietzsche talked about how the, we just got to throw the dice. I mean, in some level, we are forced to throw the dice in life one way or the other. But when we have this active thinking and awareness of what's going on, then we really can create advantages for ourselves that reduce any potential harms that come from our creation of new concepts. But because we are taking a chance, because we do have risk in life one way or the other, if we don't have these analytical tools, then we end up suffering without strategies for mitigating the damage that's going to come one way or the other. So philosophy is very, very important to cushion the ride, to create what I like to think of as cruising altitude in life. Another great thing that philosophy can do is help you craft your own personal outlook in life. Now, again, from this book, What is Philosophy? You can find a very interesting idea at the end where they suggest that opinion is chaos. And so when we create a personal outlook in life, we can base it either on opinion or we can base it on having deeply thought. What do I really think? Why do I think that? And what are the reasons that motivate me to think in these ways? And are they real? Are they true? And then we can also think, well, that is true. But just because it's true, does that mean that I have to follow it forever? Does that mean that I have to follow it even for the next five minutes? Having this ability to analyze your own mind, your own thoughts, not only shows you the personal philosophy that you have now that is helping you take shortcuts and engage your way through the world, but it can help you understand and create the path to improving that personal philosophy through depth analysis, through reflective thinking, and questions that help you improve all of this in each and every way along the way as an ongoing process. Now, in order to run this process, you'll have a number of questions that you might want to think about. And there are so many questions we could spend all day with the possible potential questions you could ask philosophically. But some of them are very simple. What is right? What is wrong? These are questions we ask ourselves every day. And so we are constantly being a philosopher. But some other questions that we might not ask daily that could be very, very useful to us is, what are my inalienable rights? What are the rights of animals? Trees, do they have any? If so, why do they have them? If not, why don't they have them? And these can help you navigate the world in different ways. You can also think about the nature of things in society that form your behaviors, like law. What is the nature of law? Where did it come into being? How does it operate? And how specifically could you participate in how that you are governed by the law. A lot of people don't think of that, but if you don't think about the law, then you are just simply governed. You're not participating in your own governance, which is an amazing thing to be able to do, to not only understand how that law affects you, but also have the chance to shape how it affects you. This is where life becomes really, really nuanced and rich and takes on a whole new depth. You can also ask questions around what is the nature of your mind? Cheshire, what's the nature of your mind? I just want my mind to disappear. Well, <laughs> hey, I've got a book on that. It's called The Victorious Mind. So far, my own mind disappears at will whenever I want it gone. And if you haven't read it yet and you want your mind to just disappear, well, then Cheshire, what are you waiting for? Get reading. Asking questions about your mind, the nature of thoughts, how they appear, how long they stay, where do they go when they leave, 
All of this is very richly rewarding and can change the nature of thought, reduce its impact on you when thoughts are negative, and increase the impact of thoughts when they are positive. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it's absolutely wonderful if my mind would disappear and stay gone. Well, <laughs> I don't want my mind personally gone forever, although that is another philosophical question. The nature of death. What does it mean to die? And where exactly is death? You know, I think that death is pretty much here with us all the time. Where else would it be? If you're not alive to perceive death, then how could you possibly perceive death? Death is in life. Death is perhaps part of life, if not the ultimate part of it, because it's always nipping at your heels. And that very idea of death nipping at your heels, that comes to me from a Buddhist meditation technique that uses a memory palace where you know, the great meditation teacher Michael Roach, if memory serves his name is, he talks about having in a station in your memory palace for the meditation where you see yourself having a little dog nipping at your heels to remind you that death is always with you and can take you any time, any old time. And you know, we shoo it away, this little dog biting at our heels. But what if we were to embrace that? What if we were to allow ourselves to be constantly reminded that this is it, this moment and only this moment, right? Because death is only in life. We cannot know what happens after that. And so how does that help shape what we do with this moment because this is the moment where we actually have the ability to interact and engage with both the ideas of life and death and to somehow make something out of this opportunity that we have to perceive it at all. Then we can think about questions of the nature of science. What does it mean to live scientifically? We know that science is essentially a tool for gathering evidence that either confirms or denies our ideas about the world. And so how should that shape our lives? What should we do when we're told this or that by scientists? And how do we actually take on the behavior of gathering evidence that confirms or denies our understanding of the world? How do we be scientific? Nietzsche was a great teacher of this in his book, The Gay Science, which literally, if you look at the German, can mean different things. That's a kind of a weird translation of the title, but you know, you might think of it as the joy of research or the joy of life based on research. Because Wissenschaft is not necessarily from German directly science, uh, although it is, but you know, it, it, I think it has a lot more nuance than that. And I think Nietzsche had a lot more in mind. I think he had something a little bit more in mind, like what the great memory masters had when they talked about research and discovery and finding ideas and then remembering them and remembering them in such a way that you remember to use them in your life. And why do I think that Nietzsche thought that? Because he mentions Giordano Bruno in Beyond Good and Evil, which suggests to me that he probably knew a thing or two about memory, old Nietzsche did. All right, there's oodles more questions. What's the nature of art, etc. I think the point is, is that we use our understanding of what it means to live scientifically to ask about the nature of our questions. How do we know that our questions are correct? How do we know that they're the best possible questions? How do we know that the answers they're providing are valid, are useful? How can we continue to ask questions as an ongoing process to guide ourselves as if we were a ship in water and we need our sails to grab the, the best possible wind to take us to a variety of destinations? And then how do we know that that's the correct destination once we've gotten there? So questions and then questioning our own questions keep moving forward as a process and then just observe what's happening as you continue to question the questions. Now you might be thinking, wait a second, wait a second. If I keep asking questions, I'm going to drive myself mad. I'll be like the mad hatter. But if you continually feed yourself information from multiple philosophers, from multiple perspectives, then you're going to avoid that trap. You're going to be able to constantly look at things from different angles and the ideas themselves will be like diamonds that have so many refracting ideas. And you'll wind up with what Tony Buzan called radiant thinking, which is the idea that your ideas aren't just floating around willy nilly, but they have force, they have direction, they have purpose, they have intent, they're light hitting the diamond and then refracting off in a direction that creates delight. And because life is always changing, we need that delight, we need that sense of deep fulfillment. And we also need how that the process keeps our minds sharp so that we might experience delight as life keeps changing and throwing challenges at us. And you know what? 
even if Cheshire doesn't think so, philosophy can be tremendously pleasurable. And rest assured, I love to read some of the biggest, most boring, dense philosophy books ever, and I use strategies from the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass to help me be able to engage with the boredom and shoo it away so that I can focus even on the toughest material. But you don't necessarily have to read those big, boring books. You can do philosophy anytime. There's episodes of The Simpsons that are extraordinarily philosophical and help us think, ah, that's a different way of looking at the world. Now, why do some people find philosophy so difficult? Well, the reason is, is because a lot of it is abstract. So if you haven't seen my video on abstract thinking and how to remember abstract concepts, please check that out. I think it will help you really understand what abstraction is and how to make it much more concrete just by simply thinking about it a little bit differently and applying some of the memory tools that I talk about in that video. So you know you're being influenced, you know when you're being influenced because you think philosophically about the words and the phrases and the images that come into your life. That's a huge benefit of philosophy. You know that you're able to look insightfully and compare and contrast different ideas. So you have the big bird's eye view. And above all, you're able to actually reduce chaos in your life because you're not basing your life on opinion. You're doing a bit of research. You're thinking deeply about that research. Philosophy is so powerful for these reasons. And we're going to go deeper and deeper on this channel because I really want to bring together the ideas of the great memory tradition with the philosophical ideas and show how we can memorize those ideas very, very quickly, bring them deeply into our lives so that we're able to actually make use of them. And then when we make new concepts, we actually can remember those concepts and we can remember to use them because nothing is further from pleasure than forgetting our goals and forgetting the tools that we have available to us to help us accomplish those goals. Right, Cheshire? My goal is still to stop thinking. Well, that's my goal too, 70% of the time. And it's just as simple as Chittameva Maha Dosham, Chittameva Hi Balakaha, Chittameva Mahatmayam, Chittameva Mahanasat. Selah.